Good morning. It's a blessing to have you all this morning for worship as we come together to once again receive the bounty of our Lord's table and the proclamation of the gospel and the fellowship of his church. Um, as part of our service this morning, we will also include uh, the welcoming of our new members, which will be a blessing as well. And I have just a few announcements for you this morning uh, as we get started and continue to connect throughout the week. Um, Unity Sunday last week uh, was a blessing as we came out of the camp out. It was a blessing to see so many people uh, to come on Saturday night, even though it was hot. And for those of you who stayed the whole week, we bless you. I also wonder about your sanity, but we bless you. It was a, it was a time. We got through it. Um, and also, uh, July 4th, we have a Unity Sunday at 10 a.m. because uh, we expect that many people will be traveling on the 4th. And it's a great opportunity to come together as the church with both services all at one time. Whenever we have a Unity Sunday, it is at 10 a.m. So if you get here for 10, 15 service, you might not be able to sit all in a clump. You'll get spread out. So, wink, wink. So uh, make sure you get here early. Also, um, I wanted to say all, uh, thank you to all of you, um, uh, the wonderful gifts after the congregational meeting um, and the, the cards and all the celebration for 10 years of ministry. That was truly a blessing. And I got to tell you a funny story. After 10 years of ministry, I had a new experience yesterday um, that has never happened to me before. Um, and it's only in Nevada that this could happen. I, I was asked to um, help a family from out of town do a memorial service for a family member. And so I went to a casino to do the memorial service up in one of their uh, small group rooms. And I was like, first of all, pastor doing a memorial service in, communion, or in, a, in a casino, that's only in Nevada. Secondly, as I was on the elevator, um, and I was going up because it was on the 17th floor. Uh, two families got into the elevator getting ready to go to the pool. And they noticed that I was going to the 17th floor. And they're like, oh, you have one of the fancy rooms, the big rooms. I was like, no, I'm not staying. And they're like, oh, well, maybe you have your own private pool. We could all come up there for that too. And I was like, no, I'm, I'm just here to do a service. <laughs> so you all got it. I'm naive. And I didn't want to put a downer on their pool, being like, hey, I'm here to do a memorial service for somebody. Like, oh, that stinks. I was wearing my St. Luke's Lutheran Church polo. <laughs> and they start making jokes about me being a service provider. <laughs> Which then my wife explained was my negligence. But I was like, only in Nevada will you get called to a casino to do a memorial service and then be called a hooker on your way to the service. <laughs> that was my yesterday. That's wild. But anyway, thank you for celebrating with me. I was like, I'm going to tell the church this is just hilarious. So, uh, but it was a good, it was a good service and a blessed time. Uh, we're, we, we enjoy being together, enjoy being a one body, the church here in this place, and getting to have this time together. And so before we begin our service with our opening hymn, I'm going to invite you all to please stand up to look for somebody new, shake your hands, introduce, well, shake each other's hands, not shake your hands. Introduce yourself to somebody new, share the peace of the Lord. Oh, man.
announcements. I actually did have other announcements besides my story to tell you. Um, we have our Stuff the Bus, our annual school uh, needs uh, supply drive. Our goal is 150 backpacks, and those are going to be due August 1st. So um, if you want to help out with the kids who have those things because they're going back to school in person next year, uh, we'd love to get them the things that they need to be successful. And also, uh, we do have coffee hour between services. So if you're an early riser and you want to get here early and enjoy coffee hour together, one, come early. You'll get to see folks from the other service. And two, we need people to sign up for that to host our coffee hours. Otherwise, we won't have coffee hours, and we can just sit and talk to each other. So um, by all means, if you're willing to sign up, there is a sign up outside, and you can sign up for a spot. And uh, we thank you, of course, for providing a space for us all to connect and enjoy that fellowship time together. So Megan, I got it, and I read them. Okay, I got my thumbs up. I didn't read them last hour, and I got chewed out a little bit. So I'm going to invite you all to please rise, because now we join together in our divine service of matins this morning. O oh Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise. Make haste, O oh God, to deliver me. Make haste to help me, O oh Lord. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Praise to you, O Christ, alleluia. Blessed be God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. O come, let us worship him. O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. The deep places of the earth are in his hands. The strength of the hills is his also. The sea is his made it, and his hand formed the dry land. Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and will be forever. Amen. Blessed be God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Oh, come, let us worship him. You may be seated for our readings. Good morning. First reading is from Lamentations chapter 3, verses 22 to 33. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in him. The Lord is good to those who wait for him, to the soul who seeks him. It is good that one should wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. It is good for a man that he bear the yoke in his youth. Let him sit alone in silence when it is laid on him. Let him put his mouth in the dust. There, there may be yet hope. Let him give his cheek to the one who strikes and let him be filled with insults. For the Lord will not cast off forever, but though he cause grief, he will have compassion according to the abundance of his steadfast love, for he does not afflict from his heart or grieve the children of men. 
Lord, have mercy on us. The epistle reading is from 2 Corinthians chapter 8, various verses. We want you to know, brothers, about the grace of God that has been given among the churches of Macedonia. For in a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in the wealth of generosity on their part. For they gave according to their means, as I can testify, and beyond their means of their own accord, begging us earnestly for the favor of taking part in the relief of the saints. And this, not as we expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord, and then by the will of God to us. Accordingly, we urged Titus that as he had started, so he should complete among you this act of grace. But as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in all earnestness, <clears throat> and in our love for you, see that you excel in this act of grace also. I say this not as a command, but to prove by the earnestness of others that your love also is genuine. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you might by his poverty become rich. For I do not mean that others should be eased and you burdened, but that as a matter of fairness, your abundance at the present time should supply their need, so that their abundance may supply your need, that there may be fairness. As it is written, whoever gathered much had nothing left over, and whoever gathered little had no lack. Lord, have mercy on us. Our gospel lesson today comes from St. Mark, the fifth chapter. And when Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, a great crowd gathered about him, and he was beside the sea. Then came one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name, and seeing him, he fell at his feet and implored him earnestly, saying, My little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her, so that she may be made well and live. And when he went with him, a great crowd followed him and thronged about him. And there was, a woman who had a, who, uh, there was a woman who had had a discharge of blood for 12 years and who had suffered much under many physicians and had spent all that she had and was no better but rather grew worse. She had heard the reports about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. For she said, If I touch even his garments, I will be made well. And immediately the flow of blood dried up and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. And Jesus, perceiving in himself that power had gone out from him, immediately turned about in the crowd and said, Who touched my garments? And his disciples said to him, You see the crowd pressing around you, and yet you say, Who touched me? And he looked around to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. While he was still speaking, there came from the ruler's house someone who said, Your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the ruler of the synagogue, Do not fear, only believe. And he allowed no one to follow him except Peter and James and John, the brother of James. They came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue, and Jesus saw a commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. And when he entered, he said to them, Why are you making a commotion and weeping? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. But he put them all outside and took the child's father and mother and those who were with him and went in where the child was. Taking her by the hand, he said to her, Talitha kumin, which means little girl, I say to you, arise. And immediately the girl got up and began walking, for she was 12 years of age. And they were immediately overcome with amazement. And he strictly charged them that no one should know this. And he told them to give her something to eat. O Lord, have mercy on us. Thanks be to God. Forever, O Lord, your word is firmly set in the heavens. Lord, I love the habitation of your house and the place where your glory dwells. Blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. 
Lord, I love the habitation of your house and the place where your glory dwells. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. Lord, I love the habitation of your house and the place where your glory dwells. At this time, I'd like to invite the children to come forward for the children's message. You all may be seated. Come on, kiddos, let's do this. Hello, hello. Look at all these girls. I promise you one day you'll say that with excitement. Oh, this is not going to work as well with my dress on. Good morning. Good morning, good morning, and good morning to my friends who are online. I have an interesting bag here of stuff that you use. It's tools to help you when you're off-roading. Now, if you're watching from a place where they don't do a lot of that, in Nevada, you know that there's lots of places you can drive your car all through the wilderness, and it's called off-roading, 4 by 4 you know, that whole thing, right? But when you're off-roading, some things can go wrong. What are some of those things that can happen? Go ahead. You can get a flat tire. Absolutely. That's a problem. Huh? The rims can get dented in. Yeah, then you're in real trouble. Absolutely. What else can happen? Your truck got a flat tire yesterday? On the boat trailer? That's even worse. And your dad fixed it? He probably had some tools that we're going to look at. What other things can happen? You can flip your, you can flip your truck over. That's not good. You can get in a car crash. What happens if you, if you drive out there after it rained? What can happen? It can, get, it can slip and get fallen over. It can also get stuck in mud. Oh, that's bad. So a friend of mine gave me this container, this bag of tools, so that if I was off-roading and anything ever happened, I would be able to get myself out of that bad situation because I'd have the tools to do it. Make sense? So I put this thing in my FJ, and I leave it in there just in case I ever need it. But you know what's funny? I've never opened it. This says master pull on the outside. So some of the things I've got, I did drop a couple extra things in it. A pair of gloves, because you know it's dirty. Now, I got this thing because it hooks onto my winch so I can make my winch go so you can pull a vehicle. So that's that. But I got this thing. Does anybody know what this is? It's not a yo-yo. Ooh, it does tell you how much air pressure you have right there. You know, I don't actually know what this is for. And luckily, the guy who gave me this, his name is Mr. Josh also, so that's going to be really fun. Uh, he's going to help us out with some of these things. So since I don't actually know what to do with these things, Josh is going to help me out. Josh, what is this thing for? Well, this is going to, you got it right. This is actually a tool that enables you to maintain flotation longer so you're able to take the air out of the tire to a preset you, can, you don't want it to go flat flat or else you have big problems like on the boat trailer but you have to have a little bit of air in the tire so that the tire gets a much longer uh, contact patch so we want to make sure with this thing that we can let some air out but not all the air out okay that sounds tricky that would be really embarrassing to have a flat tire while you're out there and it's because you let all the air out of your tires Luckily, there's nobody around to see the embarrassment. Blessing and a curse. Okay, what do you guys think this is for? It's not the winch itself, but it's definitely a rope. You're there, that's right. That's called a winch extension cable. So it's to take the winch cable that's already mounted on his truck and if the hook on the end of the winch cable doesn't, isn't long enough, you add the winch extension cable so that you can uh, get to that hard point. Okay, what about, what about this? What do you guys think this is? 
Looks like we got another one. One that's got like holes on it, one that's got a hook on it. What is it? A hook? Um, it looks like it's got some pulleys on it too. So these things spin. Yeah. So that is called a snatch block. And you attach the snatch block to a hard point away from your vehicle, and then you run your winch extension cable through the pulley, and you can either attach it back to your vehicle, or you can use the other snatch block and attach it to another hard point from away from your vehicle. Now, in Iowa, they put this in a bull's nose. <laughs> a big bull, like a moo cow, a bull, that, that, so you can guide them around, because people are motivated by that, or bulls. That's called a clevis, and it happens to attach to the trailer hitch on your vehicle. What's your question? Is the bull named Ferdinand? Sometimes. <laughs> sometimes. I'm sorry? You've seen the movie? Did he, and he had one of those in his nose, didn't he? Little bling? Absolutely. But this is for a truck. Uh, this is a strap for moving furniture. It is. It can move furniture, but it's actually designed to be a tree strap so that you can protect the tree. You wrap it around it, you put your uh, clevis through the loops in the uh, tree strap, and then you can attach your winch uh, hook to that. So there's a lot of cool toys in here, a lot of good tools. Now, it's important to have these tools in your vehicle, right, in case you run into a problem because you need, you need to be able to get out of a sticky situation. So where should I keep this? In the garage? <laughs> Don't call me when you need help. I keep it in the back of the FJ all the time in case I'm ever out there and I have a problem. But you know what's silly, though? What do you think's going to happen if I leave this bag in the back of the FJ, which is what I've done, and I never get this stuff out, I don't know what it is, and I don't know how to use it? <laughs> then what? Then I'm in trouble. Yes, I'll translate that to in trouble. Up a, up a creek without a paddle, they say. So what happens is I'm going to be out there off-roading. I'm going to have these tools when I run into a problem, but I'm not going to know how to use them. So who am I going to call? Mr. Josh, because he'll help me get, learn how to figure it out and, and tell me what to do. But you know, there's a problem. Have you ever been out in the wilderness or out in the nowhere land here in Nevada? What happens with cell phones? They don't work. So what if I can't get a hold of Mr. Josh? What good is this going to do me if I never... You know how to use it. Okay, so here's my question. Before I go out off-roading, before I have problems, what should I do? What should I do with the stuff in this bag? I should look at it? Absolutely. Special tools? Very good. Maybe I should... Maybe I should watch some YouTube videos, learn how to use it, learn what they're called, learn what they're for. Maybe I should go over to Mr. Josh's house or see if he couldn't take me out sometime, and we could practice using the tools so that when I actually have a problem, I'll know how to use them. Because leaving them, hold on just a second, leaving them in the back of my car and never looking at them and never learning how to use them won't really help me all that much, will it? Guess what? Oh, where'd it go? Oh. What is this? This is a Bible. But this, like this bag for off-roading, is a tool that God has given us to help us no matter what challenges and things we run into in our lives. But the problem is, it's good to have it with us all the time. But if we don't know how to use it, if we don't know how to read it, if we don't ask somebody who knows more about it to teach us how to use it, then, when we run into troubles, who are you going to call? Yeah, good choice. You can call Pastor Josh or somebody else who knows. But if you can't get a hold of me, if you don't have my phone number, or you don't know what's going on, it's important that you learn how to use this. So every Sunday, I am going to open the Bible, and I'm going to open it to Mark, and I'm going to begin to teach you about how to use this. So when you run into challenges in life, you'll know how to use this tool to get unstuck. Okay? And I'm going to also ask you for some extra help. When you go back to your seats, would you help me teach the adults this same lesson? Because they need to learn it too. 
because otherwise they'll be just as stuck as I am when I get out there with the FJ Cruiser. So let's fold our hands and let's pray, and then we can talk more afterwards, because my sermon is long, and people already informed me that they have restaurant um, plans at like noon, so I have to get them out of here. Yes, ma'am. I... Yeah, it is, it is, this is a very important tool. A hammer? You need something to hit your fingers with? A screwdriver? Those are all good ideas. We could talk about it more afterwards. Let's fold our hands and let's bow our heads. Let's pray together. Dear God, thank you for our teachers and for the tools you give us. Help remind us to get them out in practice and to look for times to learn. Help us to be teachers to others just like Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. All right, thank you guys so much. You can go back to your seats and I will see you later. Yes, sir. Hello. need a band-aid for that. Thank you. It's good to see you. You're welcome. I'll see you later, buddy. I'm going to invite you to get your Bibles out. You can also use your smart devices, your phones or whatever. Just don't be talking on Facebook or posting because it will show up on my screen right here. i just like to give you that heads up. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing we have in him. Amen. Now the goal of the next several months is that I'm going to unpack the Gospel of Mark for you so that um, when you get to November, you'll be able to understand, maybe have a, a, a much richer grasp of what this first of the Gospel writers is intending to communicate to first century Christians. And so we're going to dig through this. And why I invite you to open up your Bibles is because I give you these little jotted notes to help bring things into technicolor or to be more accurate in your understanding. So if you ever come back and read it later, the note is right there in your Bible so that you can also learn how to use the tools when you're in your situations as well. So we're going to open up to Mark chapter 5, beginning in verse 21. And we're going to begin to go through this story of Jesus healing Jairus' daughter. And then what is sandwiched in between that is this woman with the issue of blood. And they go together very deliberately, which is why he starts with Jairus and ends with Jairus, and then has this story inserted on the in-between. Now, 
If you're first reading of Mark, and maybe you're a foray into um, using and learning the scriptures, it's simply Jesus does miracles, therefore Jesus is God, therefore when he saves me my si- from my sins, he means it, and it's, it's true. That's good. But we're going to jump into this a little bit farther and hopefully give you some more things to chew on, Lord willing. So the first thing, um, as we heard, as I read it in the gospel lesson this morning, I'm not going to go over it again, is that it, it's actually, it's got a different feel to it. There's three places in Mark where um, Mark, when he's writing, uses a tense of the verb that is different than how we get it in English. Because when we get it in English, when it refers to Jairus' daughter, it says in like verse 22, then came one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name. But when Mark is actually writing it, he's writing it in the, in the present tense. So a more literal translation would be, one of the rulers of the synagogue comes, Jairus by name, seeing him, he falls at his feet. Puts it right into the, it's happening right now in your midst, tense. It's called the historical present. To give you an idea of what this kind of means, he only does this three times, and it has a particular urgency and force for us, the readers, who are hearing it. Is there any times in your life, and you can think back on all of your memories going back, but there's some times in your memories, those moments where, like, you can actually see everything that was happening right in that moment unfolding. Like, you could even, you can look, and I remember they were standing here, and this was happening there, and over here, and then this is all happening. You can speed up the time. You can slow it down, because whatever was happening was really critical, really important, very, very significant in your life. And so some memories disappear. Some memories, you're like, I can relive that at any moment. If you're a Harry Potter fan, any of my kids, like using the pen sieve in book five, it's the exact same thing. Woo, just had a big nerd moment. But it's just like that. If you watch a movie or you watch a play, they're doing the same thing. What's happening on stage is unfolding right there in your moment. And it's for you to experience with them. So when Jesus is, or when Mark is saying things like, and immediately this happened, and immediately this happened, he's giving you that sense of urgency, like this right now is really important. Not a story for you to pick up and hear later, but it makes a difference in your life right now in this moment. And so we're going to unpack that. As you're studying over the scriptures, and as you choose to, to read and to digest, to listen to the scriptures throughout your days and throughout your weeks, I'm going to invite you to ask three simple questions that will help you in discerning what God is trying to teach you through his word. There's three simple questions to ask. The first one is, what does this say about God? So when you think about what this text has in relationship to the rest of Scripture, what does it say about who God is? What he says his will is? How he works in this world? What his character is compared to the things he's done previously? What does this say about God? Number two, what does this say about, and this is not just for this text, this is for all texts, okay? Teach your children these three questions. It'll help them tremendously. And if you don't have kids at home, teach my kids an odyssey. And that'll be a blessing to them. Number two, What does this say about Jesus specifically? Because we know that Jesus is God incarnate as he is now present with us on earth and he is conducting and bringing about the will of God into fruition. Nobody knows the Father except through him and he gives insight and clarity into who God is. What does this say about Jesus and his work in relationship to what we know about God? And third, which is the one that we as Lutherans always like to skip over because we're cerebral in our culture, What does this say about me? My relationship to God through Jesus and how I live my life, what my character is, what the Holy Spirit is doing in and through me, any one of those questions could all come up. So first we're going to deal with what does this say about God, but I'm going to give you some more context because I see you all writing down these notes diligently, so I'll slow down. Good, so you got that that was a joke. Jesus comes again across. uh, He's on a boat, which he had said earlier, hey, you guys need to have a boat for me because these people are going to crowd me and trample me to death. So he'll take boats, and he leaves the west side of the Sea of Galilee. He heads to the east side. He does that demon possession thing and clears that out. Now he's heading back over to the west side. He's back in, um, in, in Israel's territory, okay? And he's there with his boat. The great crowds come to him again, but this time we have a ruler of the synagogue, which if you remember, the rulers of the synagogue, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, they're all trying to destroy Jesus. Like, that's what we know about them. But now we see, wait a minute, there are some of them who are open to Jesus. And they can kind of see what Jesus is about. And here's one of those, Jairus. And seeing Jesus, he falls at his feet. 
this is a first century Palestinian way of greeting somebody. It's not just a random thing that he just fell at his feet. So there's three ways that are acceptable ways that you greet in first century Palestine. If you are of equal stature and authority and respect within the community, you can greet each other with a kiss on the lips. That's gross. But you can do that. Now, if one of you has a little bit more respect and a little bit more honor, so there's definitely a, a stature separation, but you're close in relationship or in stature, you can kiss the person who has the greater stature on the cheek. Remind you of any other story? Say when Judas is going to betray Jesus. Kisses him on the cheek. There you go. And if you are a beggar and he is a king, if, if there is a huge difference between his respect and yourself, you will humiliate yourself. When you see them, you will prostrate yourself on the ground. You will bow down and you will submit yourself in a very humble position. You'll humiliate yourself, not only to acknowledge that he is far superior to you, but also to let everybody in the community know that you consider yourself lowly in comparison to who you are welcoming. And here we have Jairus, who is a leader of the synagogue, so who's probably never prostrated himself before anybody, bows down before Jesus and begs him, my little girl has no chance. She's breathing her last breath any moment, and I need you, I need you to come and lay your hands on her. This is a key point he is not addressing Jesus as a physician, like we're going to see with the woman with the issue of blood. She's like, she went to a lot of physicians. He's addressing Jesus as a holy man. See, physicians in that century are not like physicians today. And we think about physicians, and we're like, oh, maybe they were like apothecaries. Maybe they like put together weird broods of things to try to like give them concoctions to make them feel better. None of that. Physicians didn't do that. Physicians in first century, they were more like life coaches, so somebody who paid a lot of money to come in and tell you how to live your life. Because in first century, they didn't really connect like the diseases of your body to like other connecting circumstances. Like I have a cut. If you don't clean that cut, you're going to possibly get an infection and connect all those. They saw you have an infection. Tell me, how are you honoring the Sabbath? Instead of looking at what was actually going on disease-wise, they considered illness to be part of a social relational problem. And that's much more what they were concerned about. So they'd come in, you'd pay them a bunch of money, only the rich had access to them, and you would, or the well-connected, and you would come in and they would say, okay, you have a problem. It's a serious problem, maybe even since birth. What did your parents used to do? Who did they worship? What did you do for your Sabbath? Have you been eating anything unclean? And they'd go through all the social implications of what was wrong with you. But that's not what Jairus is asking for. Jairus says, my daughter has no other hope, and I need you, holy man of God, who has an intimate relationship with him, who can speak at those spiritual realms, not only with God, but against demons. I need you to not just give me ideas on what to do in her life, but to come put your hand on her body and sozo her. And in the translation, that says, make her well, sozo. That's fine. But I don't see, I mean, being a father of a nine-year-old girl, I don't see him just saying, oh, make her well when she's near death. I see him saying, sozo, I need you to save her life. Not just well, save her. And I'll humiliate myself in the hope that you would do that. Now, then we move into this other story. So Jesus is like, lead the way. And the people throng on him. They gather around him. They're touching him. They're bustling him. If you were ever at like Disney World before COVID, it's like that. Ugh. Too many people around. Too many people. They're all over. They're pushing alongside, which is exactly what Jesus said would happen. That's why he had the boat standing by. But he goes to her anyway. And while he's doing this, we see that there's a woman who has had a discharge of blood for 12 years and who had suffered much under many physicians and had spent all that she had. So we know she's a widow because she's the one who's allowed to spend the money. And we know that she has a lot of money, so she's probably well-to-do because she can afford to pay for physicians. And she's not gotten any better. All of their life coaching ideas has not made a bit of difference because she's still bleeding continually um, from, her, from her lady parts. If you don't know what area we're talking about, 
That's what the issue of blood is. Now, what this says about God answering one of those questions, Leviticus 15, 25 through 30, when Moses is leading the people out of Egypt, God gives directions for how his people are supposed to live together. And he's very specific about what this means, as you're going to see. If a woman has a discharge of blood for many days, not at the time of her menstrual impurity, or if she has a discharge beyond the time of her impurity, all the days of the discharge she shall continue in uncleanness. Now you guys know from the Old Testament that purity and cleanliness is a really big deal because it teaches them about righteousness and how they can be in relationship to God. Because they need to be right before God. They can't bring their dirty sin with them. Now, as in the days of her impurity, she shall be unclean. So she is designated not allowed to be with the community, not allowed to offer sacrifices, not allowed to be in the regular life of the people. Every bed on which she lies, all the days of this discharge, shall be to her as the bed of impurity. So if she touches a bed, it's impure. Everything that she sits on is unclean. If she sits on it, it's unclean as in the uncleanliness of her menstrual impurity. And whoever touches these things, if you touch the bed that she touched, you're unclean. Sounds like Oprah on book day. You get a book, and you get a book, and you. You're all unclean. And, if she, and, and she shall wash his clothes and bathe themselves in water if you touched the thing that she touched. And be unclean until that evening. So even after you go through all the ritual cleaning, then you still have to wait till nighttime before you'll be considered clean enough again. But if she cleanses herself of the discharge, if she shall count herself seven days, and after that she shall be clean. And then it goes into she can offer the turtle dove, she can offer the sacrifices. So basically, because of this issue of blood, she and everything she touches, everything that touches, the things that she touches are unclean, even seven days later. It's a big deal. We also can see the medical reasons for all of this. We don't want to have blood around the people because they don't have sanitation like we have today, right? You go to the doctor's office. If you look at them funny, they take off their gloves and throw them in the trash and get a new pair. That's for sanitation. But this is what God says about that. And so what we have is God says these are the impurities of which you must be separated from the people, from my people, from relationship with me. You won't offer sacrifice. You won't do these things because of your condition. And now we see this woman who has this discharge of blood for 12 years. She hears the reports about Jesus. Must be through the gossip train. She's not in a community, right? She's not allowed to be in the cities. She's off by herself. She has to be isolated from everybody else. But she hears about Jesus, and so she comes up behind him in the crowd and touches his garment. She sees an opportunity. There's so many people around that she will go unnoticed. And she says to herself, if I can just touch his garment, I will be sozo, saved. And she reaches out and touches his garment. But what we learn from Leviticus is, great, you're gross. You have a real personal problem, a sin issue, clearly, says the physicians, depending on whatever you or your parents did. Then, not only is it improper in first century Palestine for women to touch men, let alone, like, strangers, let alone holy men, but she's unclean. So what now has happened to his garments? What now has happened to Jesus? You've taken this holy man, and you've made your problems and your revolting circumstance in life his problem in his revolting circumstance in life. He is no longer allowed to be around the people. He is unclean because of her, according to Leviticus. It says in Numbers 5, 1 through 2, the Lord spoke to Moses saying, command the people of Israel that they put out of the camp everyone who is leprous Put out of the camp everyone who has a discharge and everyone who is unclean through contact with the dead. If you are a leper, if you are somebody with discharge, if you have touched the dead, you are not allowed to be within the community of God's people. You are to be put out and ostracized. Question number two, what does it say about Jesus? To this point in our story, which is only Mark chapter 5, Jesus is not worried about the flesh and its cleanliness. In Mark chapter 141, the leper shouts to Jesus, unclean, unclean, 
save me? Could you heal me? Could you sozo me? And Jesus reaches out his hand and touches the leper. And instead of the leper making Jesus unclean, Jesus' holiness is transferred to the leper, and now that leper is clean. And here for the woman with the discharge, she just touches his garment. And instead of her bringing her problems onto Jesus and making her problem his problem, he makes his holiness her holiness. So is the kingdom of heaven in Jesus. He comes to this earth and instead of being defiled by us, he brings his holiness to us and makes it our holiness. And you know what's awesome? In that moment when he turns around, and it's such a humanly thing to do. Jesus in Mark is weird. I was thinking about that. I was like, maybe I need to be more like Jesus and Mark with you guys and just be like rude and distant and weird so you know him better. I don't think that'll go well, but still, that's how Jesus is. You, you really don't understand him. Jesus in this picture, when it's recorded in Matthew and the same thing happens, Jesus turns around and goes, he looks right at the woman. He's like, who's touched my garment? And he looks right at the woman and he says, your faith has healed you. Go in peace. He looks right at her, just knows. But this one, he's walking around, he's like, whoa, what happened? <laughs> and the disciples are like, dude, like people are touching you all over the place. What do you mean, who's touching me? That's a dumb question, smart to say to Jesus. You can see that they're not getting along really well. And then he's, again, he's looking, and this woman knows what's going to happen because she's a, she's a Jew. He's going to find out who I am and what's going on, and she tells him the whole truth. Honestly, she doesn't cover it up. And she says, in her own mind, I'm going to tell him, I'm going to be honest, but I'm going to be ostracized by this community. I'm going to be rejected, and Jesus is going to revile me for what I've done because I have broken God's commandment. And Jesus says to her, not woman, not lady. Hey, lady, what's your problem? She falls down. She tells him the whole truth. And in verse 34, he says to her, Daughter. Daughter. Do you remember two weeks ago when Jesus looked and he said, Who are my mother, my brothers, and my sisters? Is it not these people who are with me, who have come to me, who are faithful to me? He says, daughter. It's not just you're welcomed. Your cleanliness is no longer a problem. You're clean. You're welcome back in the community. No, no, no. You're my family. You're my people. And when you look at this in contrast with Jairus, you see Jesus says, you're my daughter like Jairus' daughter. And I'm going to love you like Jairus loves his daughter, which means I will humiliate myself to love and save you. Because you're mine. And I'll do whatever I have to for my little girl. He says, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be sozo, saved of your disease. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And what is realized is your uncleanliness, your world problems, your ostracized, your sin problems have been healed. And you have brought into the end times finishing God's kingdom plan. You are not just saved from your bleeding. You are saved spiritually and completely. You are my child. He says your faith has made you well. We as Lutherans in, in this century think of the word faith. Your faith is something we think, something we know to be true, and something we have accepted as true. A belief in an idea or a person. That is not how they use it in the first century the vast majority of the time. The vast majority. They look at it socially. So when they say faith, they're talking about loyalty. They're talking about commitment. They're talking about holding fast to something or someone. When you got married and you said, I promise to be faithful, that did not mean I promise to accept you and believe that you are my wife from here on out. I know you to be this woman. You have this title. I accept that as true. No. What you're saying is, I will be loyal to you. I will be committed. And I will hold to you as my other half, the better part of me. When he says to her, your faith has healed you, what he's saying is, your trust in me will not go back empty-handed. If you look to me, 
if you risk everything because you know that I am your only hope, you will find satisfaction in your hope. It's yours. It's not just something she thinks and knows. The same thing unpacks here in Jairus' daughter. They come, don't fear, only believe. Why are you making a commotion? That was a regular cultural thing. You know, that's how they showed that they cared about somebody. And then he says, taking her by the hand, while Peter, James, and John, the mother and father, are the only ones there, he says, Talitha kumi. Now, if you're wondering, why do they put those words into the Bible? Why doesn't it just say, he said to her, little girl, I say to you, arise. Why did they add the original Aramaic? Because they realize that Jesus has power in his words. Those very words that he spoke carry with it Jesus' authority. So they're honored, they're revered. Talitha kumi, because Jesus spoke into existence this girl's resurrection. And then he fulfills the third of those people who are unclean. We've had the leper, we've had the issue of blood, and now not only is he brought in those who touch the dead, but he's brought in the dead themselves. He, tell, he charges them to tell nobody, which we're going to talk about another Sunday, and then he says, give her something to eat, which is welcoming her back into the family. Because as a family, you eat together. She is no longer dead. She is no longer unclean. She is no longer outside. She's part of our family. Welcome her as thus. It doesn't say that Jairus had this faith, but you know because it was partnered in there that the faith that brought Jairus to his knees is the same faith that brought that woman with the issue of blood. Your faith, your holding fast to me has made you sozo, saved. So go in my peace and be saved of your diseases. Third question is, what does this mean for me? There's a trope uh, in musicals, not all of them, and, and in storytelling called Minor Character, Major Song. Now, most recently, uh, one of those, have, have you all seen Hamilton yet? It's on Disney Plus. If you haven't seen it, Hamilton is a musical. It's great. Uh, there's a minor character, King George. It's all about the Revolutionary War, okay? It's about Hamilton <laughs> in the Revolutionary War. And King George is really not part of the story. If you took that person out of the musical, it really doesn't change the musical at all. But King George has the best and most catchy song in the entire musical. Everybody loves King George. He comes out three times to make his little jokes by tune, and then you're all like, oh yeah, King George, yeah, that's funny. And then he actually goes back into the story. He's really a minor character, but he brings this major component to it. And why I'm telling you that is because it's not bad not to be a major character. So often we think the big people of the story are Jesus, Peter, James, John, the disciples, Sometimes the Pharisees encounter contrast, and it's this huge depiction of faithful men who have big, significant lives and impact in their generation. And you know what Mark says? Yeah, Peter, James, and John were there. They were also there for the, the transfiguration, and yet these men run away when Jesus is realizing his glory and his humility. They don't get it. They never understand. All through the next few sec sections of Mark, starting in Mark chapter 8, we get Jesus frustrated with his disciples. How do you guys not get this? How can you possibly not perceive this? What is wrong with you? He gets really frustrated. It's kind of troubling and funny to look at. But what we see here is these minor characters. The woman who doesn't have a name. The daughter who doesn't have a name. Jairus, who we never see again. They see Jesus. They hold fast to Jesus. And in very small, yet now magnified ways, God is glorified through their journey. We don't have to be major characters to bring God glory and to see his work in our lives. Simply living the life that he gives us in the circumstance that we have, we still see Jesus at work welcoming us in and using our story for his glory. It doesn't have to be big. Jesus is glorified in the small things. And he's seen even in the least of these. That in all things, through heaven and on earth, he would receive glory, honor, and praise as he makes known the kingdom of heaven in his redemption. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen.
And now at this time, I'm going to welcome our new members to come forward and to be installed as new members. So if you are, if you've gone through the Roots class, if you're here, we'd like to have you come forward so that I can extend the hand of welcome to you and we can all celebrate uh, your joining our church family. Come on up, we'll have you line up here. And I'll get the microphone for afterwards. I've got three for whoever's back there. Three. Cool. Greetings to all of you. It's a blessing to have you. I know that you know something about perseverance because you endured all the hours of roots and you're still here. (laughs) And that's wonderful. It's a wonderful thing. As we talked about just moments ago, what it is to be faithful, it means that we are committed to each other. We are loyal to each other. We hold fast to one another. And it is our blessing to receive you as part of our faith community, as part of our church family, as faithful members of which. As it will be your intentions to participate regularly in worship, to to come to the Lord's table and to encourage one another in the following of our Lord Jesus Christ, to make those same promises that we all make every time a child is baptized here, that we will also help raise that child in the faith, which means we'll take out the tools and we'll teach them how to use it. We also encourage you, as you were probably a little bit nervous about that, and if not, you should be. If you remember that day of the wedding jitters, right? It's like, oh, it's going to be a great life. You're like, man, if I only knew. (laughs) What I'd be praying that day is, Lord, help me in my endeavors. Walk with me in this. Help my faithlessness in your faithfulness. And so, if it is your desire, we would like to welcome you as members and fellow family of St. Luke's. If it is your desire, you may answer by saying yes with the help of God. And so I extend the hand of fellowship and friendship that we together might work with the joy of the strength that God has given us in his ministry and in his work. And we welcome you to our church. I'm going to have you all turn around and just say your name and maybe where you're coming from. And then uh, everybody can say hello and greet you after service. So here's this so the folks online can get you. You can just say your first name. Nina. And we're coming from another church that we join with. Nina. My name's Ray, and I'm, along with Nina, coming from another church. My name is Bill Voss, and I am coming from another church to join St. Luke. I want to know where you're coming from. Like, not the church, but like, what, what location? Holy Cross. Oh, okay. Well, I've heard of that one. Absolutely. So in town here. <laughs> Yeah, in town. Perfect. Okay, Reno. We've heard of it. From Holy Cross in Reno. Okay, I'm noticing a theme. Hi, I'm Sharon Voss. Also came from Holy Cross. Um, Glad to be here and um, happy to be a new member. Thank you. I'm Jane. We relocated from Fairfield, California, and are happy to be here. And I'm Jay, and same story. (laughs) (laughs) Fairfield. And so we'll extend a round of applause and thankfulness and welcome to our new friends and family. You're the whole, no, you guys can go back to your seats. You're welcome, and thank you. Uh, we have others uh, as well who came to the earlier service, which is a joy as well. As far as Germany, so that's pretty cool. Um, lots from California as well, because that's a thing now, you all know. But it's still a blessing. And so now we join together as one church in using these words of the great Te Deum as our creed for today. I invite you to please rise. We praise you, O God. We acknowledge you to be the Lord. All the earth now worships you, the Father everlasting. To you all angels cry aloud, the heavens and all the powers therein. To you, cherubim and seraphim, continually do cry. Holy, holy, holy Lord God of Sabaoth, heaven and earth are full of the majesty of your glory. The glorious company of the apostles praise you. The goodly fellowship of the prophets praise you. The noble army of martyrs praise you. The holy church throughout all the world does acknowledge you. The 
Father of an infinite majesty, your adorable, true, and only Son, also the Holy Ghost, the Comforter. You are the King of glory, O Christ. You are the everlasting Son of the Father. When you took upon yourself to deliver man, you humbled yourself to be born of overcome the sharpness of death. You open the kingdom of heaven to all believers. You sit at the right hand of God in the glory of the Father. We believe that you will come to be our judge. We therefore pray you to help your servants have redeemed with your precious blood. Make them to be numbered with your saints in glory everlasting. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. We gather our offerings at the end of the service with baskets as you leave the building. And also for you who are online, uh, we also uh, can receive gifts and your tithes through those three ways that you see on your screen. It's our opportunity to respond in thankfulness for as God has given us time, talents, gifts, all these wonderful treasures to use that we would see his glory enacted through our lives here in this place. And so we join together now praying the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord be with you and with your spirit we pray lord heavenly father we come before you with great confidence knowing that we hold fast to our lord jesus and he will not let us be put astray for we are held not by our ability but by his not by our acceptance but by his acceptance of us and Lord, according to the mercies that you've shed forth in the kingdom of heaven is made known in him, we ask for healing for all those who are sick and troubled. We pray for Randy and Jeff, Lynn, Dana, Rochelle, Steve, Donna, Marvin, Zach, Jim, Margo, Gina, Ursula, Bruce, Patrick, Jeff, Sam, Kathy, Jeremy, Margaret, Peggy, Jim, Mike, Brian, Grady, Dale, Peter, Nell, Gail, Ashley, John, Anne-Marie, Linda, Kenna, Rosie, JJ, Michelle, and Mary. Lord, we ask that you'd provide people around them to build them up and to encourage them in these days. Lord, we ask that you would be with Kylie, Alyssa, and Ashley as they're traveling. We thank you for the opportunity that uh, Lauren soon has to give birth to another child. We ask that you'd keep them safe, and that you'd watch over their next daughter. Lord, we also thank you for the opportunity to celebrate birthdays for Lauren, Esther, and Aaron, for the opportunity to be reminded of your faithfulness through the years and for your continued faithfulness in each new day. And Lord, we also thank you for the gift of marriage as you've shown us once again how much Christ has loved his church and has brought unity to us and love unconditional through the power of forgiveness. We ask that you'd bless Alan and Diane, Becky and Jim, Mike and Megan. Lord, we ask that you would be with Eric's family at his passing. Uh, Lord, when these things happen in these accidents, Lord, we just, our lives are thrown crazy sideways. We don't know which way is up, but we know that Christ, only you might bring joy and sozo saving grace to those circumstances. So bind up the brokenhearted and bring them peace in your goodness. And Lord, we also ask this for all those who were hurt and died in that condo collapse in Florida. 
Lord, tragedy hits, sin and death, the devil are always prowling, always looking for opportunity to try to separate us. And lo, we find great joy and hope in knowing that Christ has overcome all of these, and no matter what they might try to, to do to assail us, we will be one of Christ until life everlasting. O oh Lord, our Heavenly Father, almighty and everlasting God, you have safely brought us to the beginning of this day. Defend us in the same with your mighty power, and grant that this day we fall into no sin, neither run into any kind of danger, but that all our doings, being ordered by your governance, may be righteous in your sight. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. in peace. Serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank